Five seconds. Recording started. Brothers and sisters, again, thank you for tuning in to another edition. YouTube, thank you, thank you, thank you for tuning in for, to another edition of the Bible Class Truth Hour. If you can do something for us, YouTube, just right beneath here, hit that subscribe button. Hit that subscribe button and hit that bell so you will be alerted every time a video is uploaded for the Bible Class Truth Hour. Again, brothers and sisters, welcome, welcome, welcome. Today's lesson is the Lord's Holy Day of Atonement. We're going to talk about that, which it starts next week. We are a week away from the Lord's Day of Atonement, right? And so, but today, this evening, brothers and sisters, we are in the Lord's Feast Day, which is called the Memorial of the Blowing of Trumpets. We're going to talk about that before we get into the Day of Atonement. And that was the lesson that we taught last week. So, the memorial, the blowing of trumpets symbolizes the last trumpet that's blown that leads to the coming of Christ. And we're going to read Leviticus, the 23rd chapter, and show you, brothers and sisters, that in the seventh month of the year, there is a lot of things that take place in the seventh month of the year. Jesus comes back. You have a day of atonement in which we all must repent because it says that Jesus, when he comes, brothers and sisters, he's going to give us an opportunity to choose and pick whose side we're going to be on. The Bible said he pleads with us. Well, that type of pleading is not the type of pleading that we know today. It's either you have a choice to roll with me or you have to face the fate of those who don't roll with me. And the Bible said he has a sword dripping with blood. Why do you think that is, brothers and sisters? Also, in the seventh month of the year, you have the great gathering that takes place, right? Which is um, the Feast of Tabernacles. All that stuff happens in the seventh month of the year. So we know what month Jesus is coming back. Because the Bible tells us based on the Lord's holy days. So that's why it's important for us to know the Lord's holy days what they mean, what they represent, what month or season they take place in. We know that Jesus got to come back when he does come back, one of the months of the year. Well, in the Bible, it says that the memorial of the blowing of trumpets is in the seventh month of the year, right? And that marks his coming. So I know you've probably never heard this type of talk or teaching in some of the Sunday Bible classes they, many of them wouldn't dare to tell you what month Jesus comes back in, but we know that according to his word, that it's the seventh month. And we're going to show you that brothers and sisters. All right. We're going to show you that. So now let's go and start this lesson with the, what we believe. Again, let's go and start this lesson with the, what we believe. And the reason why we do that is because many people who watch this show they want to know, what are they? Are they Muslims? Are they fanatics? Are they this? Are they that? Are they Hebrew Israelite? Are they... We profess to be Christians, brothers and sisters. We are descendants of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, according to the Bible, because the descendants of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob would be spread throughout the four corners of the earth by way of the slave trade. And we are among the people that were spread it out through the four corners of the earth by way of the slave trade. So we know that we are descendants of the Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. This is what makes us a Hebrew. Because Abraham was a Hebrew. But not only those of us who are descendants of the transatlantic slave trade are Hebrew, Arabs are Hebrews too. The Edomites or descendants of Esau, they are Hebrew too. Because they are all, we are all descendants of Abraham. However, what makes us an Israelite is because we are descendants of Jacob. The Arabs are not descendants of Jacob. They're descendants of Ishmael. The Edomites are descendants of Esau. So we are Hebrew Israelites as far as our nationality is concerned. Has nothing to do with religion or belief. That's our nationality. Our belief 
is Christianity. So this book right here called the Bible, this is what we believe in. We use the King James Version of the Bible, but this is what we believe in. We believe in this. We believe in the word of God and what it says in here. We believe. Well, let's read off what we believe, brothers and sisters. Now, the Truth Hour Bible class is an online Bible based ministry, social media ministry. We teach the uncut word of God as it is written in the Bible, line upon line, precept upon precept, here a little, there a little, Isaiah 28 and 10. Our mission is to lead as many souls to Jesus the Christ so that through the word of God and the keeping of the commandments, we may receive salvation. Our motto is, if you cannot read it, then do not believe it. What we believe. We believe in the name of Jesus. We have no dispute if you want to use Yahshua. Yahweh, or any of the other variations of the name from the Hebrew to the Latin to the Greek to the Old English. We have no dispute with those variations of the name. So we use the name Jesus. Don't have a dispute with us. Number two, we believe that Jesus alone is our Lord and Savior. Number three, we believe in the Sabbath day. Why do we believe in the Sabbath day? Because the Lord told us in the Ten Commandments, remember the Sabbath day and keep it holy. So we believe in the Sabbath day, which is from Friday sundown to Saturday sundown, right? After Saturday sundown starts the first day of the week, which is Sunday. That's not the Sabbath day. Number four, we believe in the seven feast days of the Lord as listed in Leviticus, the 23rd chapter. And that's why we're coming to you tonight to teach you about the Lord's feast days, starting with the one that we are currently in right now as I speak, the memorial of the blowing of trumpets. Number five, we believe that we, the so-called African-American and those who were spread throughout the world through by way of the transatlantic slave trade, are indeed Israelites. And the statutes, laws, and the commandments apply to us. Number six, we believe that we must keep the law to the best of our ability. Number seven, we believe that we must keep the Lord's dietary law. No shrimp, no pork, no snail, no lobster, no catfish, or anything that's deemed unpermissible, according to Leviticus, the 11th chapter. Remember, he wanted to set us apart. He wanted to make us a peculiar people, right? Let's go ahead and continue, brothers and sisters. Number, that's where we at. Number eight. We believe that both the Old Testament and the New Testament must be used when teaching the word of God. You can't be an Old Testament scholar or a New Testament Christian. You must be both. According to Isaiah 8 and 20. Number nine, we don't believe in Sunday Sabbath service. The Lord didn't give us that. The Romans gave us that. We don't believe in the Trinity doctrine. The Bible does not support that. They are not three gods in one. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Ghost. Show me where in the Bible where it calls the Holy Ghost the God. The Holy Ghost is not a God, brothers and sisters. As a matter of fact, we do a lesson on who and what the Holy Ghost actually is. So go to the Truth Hour and type in Truth Hour and who is the Holy Ghost. We got a whole lesson on that. Number uh, uh, number nine, we're still on number nine. We don't believe in the cross or any religious emblems or symbols. We don't believe in holidays that originated in the worship of other gods, such as Easter or Christmas. These are antichrists according to the Bible. Number 10, we believe that salvation through Jesus is for all people, no matter what race, color, or nationality. Revelation 79. At this time, brothers, we ask that if you have a hat on to remove your hat. Sisters, if you don't have a hair covering on, we ask at this time that you go get a scarf or some type of hair covering so that we can be in compliance with the ordinance of God, which is written in 1 Corinthians. That's the New Testament. 1 Corinthians, the 11th chapter, verses 3 through 6, which states that if a woman is praying or prophesying, and this is what we're doing, this is prophecy, that she must have her head covered. And if a man is praying or prophesying, then he must uncover his head. So sisters, please go 
or get a head covering. Brothers, please remove your head covering if you have a hat on or some type of kufi over your head, okay? Remove your kufi or your head covering. Now, the Lord's Day of Atonement. When we look at the feast days of the Lord, we got to ask ourselves the question. What does it mean and what is its purpose? The word atonement alone means to make amends or to repair something that has been damaged that you are personally responsible for. I'm going to say that again. The word atonement or atone means to make amends or reparations for something that you are personally responsible for. The day of atonement is a day in which the Lord commands us to fast. I'm going to say that again. We can do a fast ourselves. We can do a fast on our own any time of the year in which we want to do it. However, this day is the only day that the Lord commands us to fast. And this is why we're coming to you before the Holy Day of Atonement so that you can be prepared for it when it comes. It's not here yet. Today is the memorial of the blowing of trumpets. So this is what we're celebrating today, the memorial of the blowing of trumpets. So please go to Bible class with me tomorrow if you're off work. And this is why we tried to come to you last week so that you can take the day off so that you can be off so that you can attend. Right. It is the only day, again, that the Lord commands us to fast. In this lesson, you're going to learn and find out when the day of atonement is and what's the purpose behind it, what the day of atonement is. And what the purpose behind it is. Let's go to the book of Leviticus, the 23rd chapter. Let's start there. Let's look at the Lord's feast days. And then we're going to read about the Day of Atonement. But again, we're going to have to be prepared mentally and spiritually for this day before it gets here. Okay? So let's go to Leviticus, the 23rd chapter. Leviticus 23. And when we go to Leviticus, the 23rd chapter, we're going to start at verse 1. Leviticus 23, we're going to start at verse 1, and we're going to read down. And it reads, And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, um, and anyone who's in Team Truth Hour that's out there, um, if you can put up the scriptures into Key Israel, is available. It says, And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Speak unto the children of Israel, and say unto them concerning the feast of the Lord. So I ask you the question. Who is this feast concerning? This feast is concerning the feast of the Lord, right? So I don't want you to say that this is the feast of the Jews or this is Moses' feast or the things that we've heard, which was a scapegoat for people to get away from it because they said, oh, well, well, we're not Jews. We don't have to keep this. You're a follower of Jesus. You believe in the Lord. So if you believe in the Lord and you are a follower of Jesus, then this is something that the Lord is saying he wants you to do. And after today, you don't have any excuse. We don't have any excuse. Leviticus 23 and 2, speak unto the children of Israel and say unto them concerning the feast of the Lord, which you shall proclaim to be holy gatherings, even these are my feasts. Six days shall work be done, but the seventh day is the Sabbath day of rest, a holy convocation. You shall do no work therein. It is the Sabbath of the Lord in all your dwellings. So we're not in our land anymore. We're here in America. Wherever we live, in all your dwellings, the Lord said, this is what I'm commanding you to do. It don't matter where you live. Number four, 
These are the feasts of the Lord, even holy convocations, which you shall proclaim in their seasons. So you see how man has it where every season there's a holiday attached to the season. During the fall season, where the harvest is, man says we have Thanksgiving. Which they got that from the Feast of Tabernacles from the Lord. But anyway, they came up with their day. They called it Thanksgiving. It's a fall festival. That's why the images of it has a basket, a pumpkin, corn, and all these other things. It is a fall festival. Right? Easter, man's holiday, is celebrated during spring. You don't celebrate Easter any other day of the year. You celebrate it during spring because it was the celebration of the goddess of fertility. The sex goddess of fertility who celebrated in spring, which is the time of the year when things in nature grow back. Grass out of the ground, leaves out of the trees. So, so that was a seasonal festival. It had nothing to do with God, but it was a seasonal festival. Well, the Lord has feasts as well. And they ought to be celebrated in their season. So the season that we're in now, coming up is fall, and it is the seventh month of the year. Today is the first day of the seventh month of the year, according to the Lord. Let's read about it. Leviticus 23, and let's go down. Let's go down, Leviticus 23, and I believe it's 23. Leviticus 23 and 23. Remember, today is the memorial of the blowing of the trumpets. Let's read it. Leviticus 23 and 23. And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Speak unto the children of Israel, saying, In the seventh month, in the first day of the month, shall you have a Sabbath, a memorial of the blowing of trumpets, a holy convocation. So what does this tell you? If today, right now at sundown, is the memorial of the blowing of trumpets that mean that we are in the first day of the seventh month according to the Lord. Well, I thought that this was the ninth month, Brother Black Eyes. Well, what comes after September? October? What's the first three letters of October? O-C-T. If you put O-C-T in front of any word, what does it mean? It means eight. Octagon. How many sides? Eight. Octopus, how many tentacles? Eight. That's why it was given its name October, because it was originally the eighth month of the year. Everything lines up with the Lord, brothers and sisters. So it says here that the memorial of the blowing of trumpets is the first day of the seventh month. And this is the day that we're in right now. It says you got to have a holy convocation. You're commanded to have church. So any time between sundown today and sundown tomorrow, you're supposed to have a holy gathering or a convocation or church. How many of our Christian brothers and sisters even know this in order to be able to keep this? But this is why we're sharing it with you today. And we shared it with you last week so that you could be prepared for today. And today we're showing you what must be done five days from now so that you can prepare for that. So let's go ahead and continue reading, brothers and sisters. That was dealing with the memorial of the blowing of trumpets, right? Now, we're going to start at verse 26, Leviticus 23, and we're going to read 26 through 32. Leviticus 23, verses 26 through 32. Now we're dealing with the Lord's Day of Atonement. So remember, the Memorial of the Born of Trumpets, which is today, is on the first day of the month, of the seventh month. Let's find out when the Lord's Day of Atonement is. And I and, and I probably misspoke because I said five days, but let's read the Bible, right? Verse 26, it says, And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Also, on the 10th day of this seventh month, there shall be a day of atonement 
and it shall be a holy convocation, which means we got to go to church on that day too, unto you. And you shall afflict your souls and offer an offering made by fire unto the Lord. What does he mean by afflict your souls? We must fast on this day. The Lord's day of atonement, brothers and sisters. So you got 10 days, nine days to prepare. Nine days to prepare from this day to fast when the Lord commanded us to do so, which is the Lord's Day of Atonement. We don't offer an offering of fire anymore because Jesus offered his body in replace of our offerings and our sacrifices. So we no longer do offerings and sacrifices anymore from that perspective, brothers and sisters, but we offer our obedience that's what we offer today. Verse 28. And you shall do no work in that same day, for it is a day of atonement to make an atonement for you before the Lord your God. For whatsoever soul it be that shall not be afflicted. So if you don't fast that day, in that same day, he shall be cut off from among his people. And whatsoever soul it be that doeth any work in that same day, the same soul will I destroy from among his people. You shall do no manner of work. It shall be a statue forever. Oh, that's the Old Testament that you're reading. The Lord said right here, verse 31, it shall be a statue forever. Let me ask you a question. Has forever ended yet? It shall be a statue forever, verse 31, throughout your generations and all your dwellings. So that knocks every excuse out the box. It ain't about it being an Old Testament. It says it's a statue forever. Throughout your generations, wherever you live, even if you're not in Israel today or in the Holy Land today. Verse 32, it shall be unto you a Sabbath of rest. And you shall afflict your souls in the ninth day of the month at evening. Why? First it said the tenth day. Now it says the ninth day of the month at evening. Why did it say the ninth day of the month at evening? Because the evening when the sun goes down starts a new day. So the Lord said, if you didn't get it the first way I explained it to you, I'm giving it to you another way in which you can understand it. So on the ninth day when the sun goes down at evening, it's still the tenth day. So from evening unto evening, from e verse 32, from evening unto evening shall you celebrate your Sabbath. So we know we got a 24-hour period in order to celebrate our Sabbath. But the question is, Lord, what does this mean? What does this have to do with us? What does it symbolize? Well, we need to go into Exodus, the 29th chapter, to find out why would we need a day of atonement in the first place? Again, in previous lessons, we talked about the sin of Adam and Eve in the garden. From that moment, no flesh and blood human being has been sin free with the exception of Jesus. Let's go back and find out what the purpose of atoning is in the book of Exodus, the 29th chapter. Turn your Bibles to Exodus, the 29th chapter. And again, the reason why we read so much is because our motto is, if you can't read it, then don't believe it. So I don't even want you to believe me. I want you to believe the word of God that I'm reading, brothers and sisters. Exodus, the 29th chapter, and let's read verses 1 through 3, and it reads. And this is the thing that you shall do unto them to hollow them. We want you to make us holy, separate us from what everybody else is doing out there in the world. To minister unto me. In the priest's office, take one young bullock and two rams without blemish. 
Now, what does the young bullock and the ram without blemish represent? It represents our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. But before he came, they were using animals to sacrifice. So let's continue reading. Verse 2, it says, And unleavened bread and cakes unleavened, tempered with oil, and wafers unleavened, anointed with oil, of wheaten flour shall thou make them. Now, when it says unleavened, it means no yeast in it. No rising agent can be in this bread or in these cakes or in these wafers. Why, Lord, are you telling us to not put any leavening in these things? Because leavening represents sin. So the whole purpose of this was to remove the sin. But before you can remove the sin, you got to atone for it. Let's continue reading to verse 3. And you shall put them into one basket and bring them in the basket with the bullock and two rams. And Aaron and his son shall bring unto the door of the tabernacle of the congregation a and shalt wash them with water. So they had a whole ceremony and a whole process in which they were doing things. But why were they doing it? Let's go down to verse 33. Verse 33, Exodus 29 and 33. And it reads, and they shall eat those things wherewith the atonement was made to consecrate and to sanctify them, but a stranger shall not eat thereof because they are not holy. Why were not the strangers holy at this time? Because the Lord in the book of Malachi, I believe it was the third chapter, said Israel is the only nation that I have ever known. So the Lord didn't have a relationship with other people and other nations. Not into the book of Acts, brothers and sisters, when this thing was opened up and the Gentiles was led in the door. I know they got a song out now called They Didn't Let the GDs in the Door. Well, maybe we ought to let it create a song called They Didn't Let the Gentiles in the Door. And so Jesus gave you a sign of what he was going to do when he was speaking to the woman at the well, when he called the woman a dog. Shall I get the dogs, the, the, the children's meat, talking about the children of Israel's meat? And the woman said, even the dogs, you know, would take the crumbs or something. And that's sort of paraphrasing. And so Jesus said, because of your faith. So if you're not an Israelite, but you have faith, how do you have faith? Not by words, but by actions. If you're keeping the Sabbath day, if you're refraining from eating those meats that the Lord said we ought to refrain from. If you are treating your neighbor like you would want to be treated. It's your behavior that qualifies you with the Lord to be a part of the body of Christ. So the Lord said here, verse 33, these things were to make an atonement, brothers and sisters. They were to make an atonement. <clears throat> and that atonement was made for sin. Let's go to the book of 1 John. Turn your Bibles to the book, book of 1 John. Now, Atonement and sin are joined together because they parallel one another, brothers and sisters. There would be no need for atonement if there was no sin. This also ties into the law versus grace theory. Some say that we're no longer in need of keeping the law. We are under grace. But again, if there is no law, there can be no sin. You get it? Because sin is what? Let's find out. First John, the third chapter, verses one through four. First John, I believe it's first John, <clears throat> the third chapter, verses one through four. Let's find out what sin is. Not according to what you and I think. But according to what the word says, 1 John, the third chapter. And let's find out what the word sin means according to the Bible. Let's go down to verses 3 and 4. 1 John, the third chapter, verses 3 and 4. It says, and every man that has this hope in him purifieth himself, even as he is pure. What whosoever... Commit sin 
transgress or breaks also the law. For sin is the transgression or the breaking of the law. My question is today to you. Is there still sin on the earth? Are people still committing sin? The sin, the sin still exists. Well, if sin still exists, then guess what? There's a law that also exists that's being broken. So we are still held to keeping the law. Now, the term under the law is used when you violate the law, then you are under the penalty of the law. So we want you to understand the correct terminology and how to use these things properly. So when you're speaking to people, you can really understand and get a gauge of their understanding and if they are biblically correct or not. All right. Everybody can be correct when they talk about, I just feel, I just think. Well, that's how you feel. That's how you think. I can't tell you how you feel is wrong. I can't tell you how you think is wrong. But I can tell you if it's wrong, according to the word of God, if you saying, well, I just feel God thinks. No, God shares with you and tells you what he thinks. All you got to do is read his word. Stop guessing. Stop trying to think for God. You can't do that. So that's what his word is for, because it allows us into his mind. Let's go back to the book of Leviticus, the fourth chapter. Let's go back to the book of Leviticus, the fourth chapter. For those who just tuned in, we're dealing with the Lord's Day of Atonement, which is nine days away from now. The Lord's Day of Atonement, which is nine days away from now. We want you to get prepared for it because we got to fast on this day. The only day of the year that we're commanded to fast. No food, no water. Now, again, if you have medicine that you have to take, you have to take a sip of water with your medicine. The Lord understands, brothers and sisters. Now, everywhere you read about atonement, you're going to run into sin. You can't have one without the other. Leviticus 4 and 20. Leviticus 4 and 20. And it reads... And he shall do with the bullock, remember we just read about that, as he did with the bullock for a sin offering. So shall he do with this, and the priest shall make an atonement for them, and it shall be forgiven them. And he shall carry forth the bullock without the camp, and burn him, and he burned the first bullock. It is a sin offering for the congregation. So one bullock is for the congregation. 22, when a ruler have sinned and done somewhat through ignorance against any of the commandments of the Lord, his God concerning things which should not be done and is guilty, or if his sin wherein he has sinned come to his knowledge, he shall bring his offering, a kid of the goats, a male without blemish, and he shall lay his hand upon the head of the goat and kill it. In the place where they killed the burnt offering before the Lord, it is a sin offering. So we keep on running into atonement and sin offering. Atonement and sin offering. Let's go down to 31. And it reads, And he shall take away all the fat thereof, as the fat is taken away from the sacrifice of peace offerings. And the priest shall burn it, Upon the altar for a sweet savor unto the Lord. And the priest shall make an atonement for him. And it shall be forgiven him. Again. All these things about animals being sacrificed. And atonement being made. But all these things were precursors. To the coming of Jesus. For the blood of bulls and goats couldn't take away the sin. They only covered the sin brothers and sisters. Verse 35, and he shall take away all the fat thereof, and the fat of the lamb is taken away from the sacrifice of the peace offering, and the priest shall burn them upon the altar, according to the offerings made by fire unto the Lord. And the priest shall make an atonement for his sin that he hath committed, and it shall be forgiven him. Remember we read in the book of Leviticus, they say an offering 
made by fire? Well, this is what this was talking about because some of the offerings had to be burned. The fat had to be burned. Part of the sacrifice had to be burnt. That was your burnt offering to the Lord that was made for your sin. So again, brothers and sisters, before Jesus came and died for our sins, this is what our people was doing. Killing animals and making animal sacrifice for sin so that they can be atoned for their sin. Let's go ahead and continue our lesson, the Lord's Holy Day of Atonement. Now, from the blood of an animal to the blood of Jesus. From the blood of an animal to the blood of Jesus. Let's go to the book of Genesis, the third chapter. The first time we read about animal sacrifice for sin, brothers and sisters, you can find it in the Garden of Eden in the first book of the Bible in the book of Genesis. I have been reading this my whole life, but it wasn't until a couple of years ago when the Lord revealed to me that the first life form in God's creation that suffered a physical death was an animal that was offered for sin. Let's go and read it. Genesis, the third chapter. Genesis, the book of Genesis. Turn your Bible to the book of Genesis, the third chapter. And we're going to read about this offering, this sin offering that was being done that eventually led into the law of animal sacrifice. Genesis, the third chapter. And for the sake of time, brothers and sisters, we won't read the whole thing, but we know what happened. Satan came, lied to Eve, caused her to go to her husband and spread the lie to her husband. And they did something that the Lord told them not to do. I don't want you talking to that being right there, whom the Bible calls the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Because the day that you talk to him, you're going to die. Now, of course, they didn't die that day. But remember, one day to the Lord is as a thousand years. None of them, Adam nor Eve, lived to see a thousand years old. So they died in the day that they sinned, according to the Lord's time. Learning something on the way to learning something. So now we know what happened. Let's go to verse 11 through 13 and find out what the penalty was. It says, and he said, who told you that you were naked? Trees don't talk. Fruits don't talk. So the tree of the knowledge of good and evil was just another name for Satan. The fruit was nothing but the information that Satan had gave Eve. So it says, and who told you that you were naked? Have you eaten of the tree? Where have I commanded you that you should not eat and the man said the woman whom you gave to me gave me to be with she gave me of the tree and i did eat so adam threw eve under the bus <clears throat> so anytime we get in trouble that's why the police take you in a room and they integrate you and then you end up throwing the person that you were with under the bus this is where it started <clears throat> verse 12 and the man said, the woman that you have given to me, she gave me of the tree and I did eat. And the Lord said unto the woman, what is this that you have done? And the woman said, the serpent beguiled me and I did eat. The man blamed the woman. The woman blamed Satan. Everybody's blaming somebody else. Nobody's taking responsibility. Right. But now the key that I want to get to in here is in the, the uh, 21st verse. Let's see what happened because of sin. The 21st verse. He said, remember when they sinned, they knew that they were naked and they made them fig leaves to cover themselves because the law, which Adam knew, is that thou shalt not kill. So they couldn't kill an animal. But look at what the Lord did. In verse 21, unto Adam, also unto his wife, did the Lord God make coats of skin 
Where did he get the coats of skin from? He got the coats of skin from an animal. We, You wear coats today of skin. You wear chinchilla. You wear furs. You wear rabbits. You wear coats of skin today in the wintertime. Lamb. Chinchilla, rabbit, fur, fox. Verse 21, and unto Adam and to his wife did the Lord God make coats of skin and clothe them. Because they sinned, an animal had to be killed to cover their sin. But it couldn't take the sin away. So let's go ahead and continue with our lesson. The day of atonement from the blood of animals to the blood of Jesus, from the blood of animals to the blood of Jesus. Let's go to the book of Leviticus, the 17th chapter from the first act of animal sacrifice that was done by the Lord. It had been condoned by the Lord to do so for man and his sin to sacrifice until the coming of Jesus. It was never about the body, brothers and sisters. It was always about the blood. It was never about the body of the animal. It was always about the blood. Let's go to Leviticus, the 17th chapter. And we're going to read one verse. Leviticus, the 17th chapter. And we're going to read verse 11. Leviticus 17 and verse 11. And it reads, for the life of the flesh is in the blood. For the life of the flesh is in the blood. And I have given it to you upon the altar to make an atonement for your souls. For it is the blood that maketh an atonement for your soul. So this is why Jesus' blood had to be shed for us to make an atonement. For our sins, brothers and sisters. This is why this day of atonement is so important to us. Because remember, today we're already in the memorial of the blowing of trumpets, which signals and signifies the coming of the Lord. And if you are alive at the time of the coming of the Lord, and if you are not in the first resurrection, which means that you'll be instantly changed in the moment, in an instant, in a twinkling of an eye to be in the first resurrection. But if you're not in the first resurrection, brothers and sisters, you have to atone. And Jesus gives you time to atone even when he comes back. He gives you an opportunity and time to atone, brothers and sisters. But while we are alive today, this message comes from the Lord through his word that as long as you have breath in your body, you have an opportunity to atone as well. So this is where we are. All right. So let's go to the book of Joel, the second chapter. The book of Joel, the second chapter. Atonement not only came with animal sacrifice, brothers and sisters, but it also came with the personal sacrifice. Fasting, denying yourself and afflicting your soul is what the Lord requires of us to teach us discipline, brothers and sisters. Why would you deny yourself? You would deny yourself to control your appetite. The reason why we get in so much trouble is because we can't control our appetites and our lust. So when you fast, brothers and sisters, it is a matter of controlling your appetite. Even when you get so hungry that you got to say, man, I need to eat something. I, I just need to put something in my mouth. I just need to wipe, wet my mouth with something. But you deny yourself. And this is the way that we have to learn how to become when we get those urges in our body. 
to do the things that we know that we are not supposed to do, brothers and sisters. Because when we do the things that we're not supposed to do, it leads to sin. And then we have to make what? Atonement for that sin. Let's go to the book of Joel, the second chapter and read verses 12 and 13. Joel, the second chapter, verses 12 and 13. And it reads, therefore also now, saith the Lord, turn ye even to me with all your heart and with fasting and with weeping and with mourning and rend your heart, rend your heart and your garments and turn unto the Lord your God, for he is gracious and merciful, slow to anger and of great kindness and repenteth him of the evil. So the Lord is just like your mother. To your mother, no matter how much wrong you do, you got addicted to drugs. You stole everything that wasn't nailed down at the house. Mama's still going to love you. She's still going to pray for you. She's still going to hope that you turn from your ways. That's the way the Lord is. The Lord has a motherly love for his children. A motherly love for his children, brothers and sisters. He's slow to anger. He gives us an opportunity and a time to get ourselves together because we got to grow and mature in this word too, brothers and sisters. It's something different when you know the word, but you're not mature in your spiritual man, in your spiritual self. It's something different when you're not mature. But the more you read and the more mature you become, the more God will begin to open these things to you and increase your understanding in these words so that you can begin to comply with the things that he wants us to comply with. Let's go to the book of Hebrews, the 10th chapter. <clears throat> Hebrews, the 10th chapter. So we've been reading about animal sacrifice, right? So the Lord has or had a law of animal sacrifice, which he allowed us to use to kill an animal to cover our sin. He allowed us to do that. So let's read about that law of animal sacrifice. Now, when you read Hebrews, the 10th chapter, it was taught to me as a child that this was talking about all the laws of God. Ten commandments and all. But now, since we know better and we have matured in our spiritual man, let's read with more understanding. It says, for the law, let's stop. We know this is talking about, about the law, but which law is it talking about? What I want you to do is get a pen and a sheet of paper. I want you to write down how many times I read the word offering and how many times I read the word sacrifices. And when we read those words, we understand which law this is talking about. The law of animal sacrifice. But let's read it so you can understand now. For the law having a shadow of good things to come and not the very image of the things can never with those sacrifices, write that down, that's one. They offer, write that down, that's one. Year by year, continually make the comers there unto perfect. So these sacrifices and offerings couldn't make the comers there unto perfect. Let's continue reading. We got one and one so far. One sacrifice that we read and one word offering that we read. Verse two. Hebrews 10 and 2. For then would they not have ceased to be offered. What would not have been ceased to be offered? These animals. Because that the worshippers once purged should have had no more conscience of sins. So if these animals could take away sins, then there would be no need to keep killing animals over and over again. But they couldn't take away sins. They can only cover them. Verse 3. But in those sacrifices, there is a remembrance again made of sins every year. 
For it is not possible that the blood of bulls and of goats should take away sins. So what law is this talking about? The law of animal sacrifice, brothers and sisters. So when it starts off the chapter for the law, it's only talking about one law. The law of animal sacrifice. But let's continue to read. Verse 5. Wherefore, when he come into the world, and that's the son whom we know today is Jesus, Yeshua, he saith, sacrifice and offering thou wouldest not, but a body hast thou prepared for me. And burnt offerings and sacrifices for sin, thou hast had no pleasure. So the Lord wasn't pleased and man killing animals for something that he did. You're going to get one of those little innocent animals and you're going to kill him to cover your sin for something you did. He had no pleasure in that. Verse seven. Then said I, lo, I come in the volume of the book. It is written of me to do thy will, O Lord. Above, when he said, sacrificing and offerings and burnt offerings and offerings for sin, thou wouldest not, neither had pleasure therein, which are offered by the law. Then said he, lo, I come to do thy will, O God. He taketh away the first animal sacrifice, that he may establish the second, which is the sacrificing of himself for the remission of sin, brothers and sisters. Verse 10 and 11, by the which will we, by the which will we are sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once and for all. And every priest standeth daily ministering and offering oftentimes the same sacrifices, which can never take away sins. We're talking about atonement. We're talking about sin. We're talking about animal sacrifice, which was replaced by the sacrifice of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, brothers and sisters. Now, we got a lot in this lesson to cover. For the sake of time, I want to be obedient and not hold you all hostage on this lesson tonight. So let's go to the book of Jeremiah, the 23rd chapter. The question that we must ask is, why aren't we learning about these feast days, these holy days in the church? Wouldn't, wouldn't you think that it would be important for you to know what the Lord wants us to do and how he wants us to keep this day when the day is? And what we're supposed to do on that day? Have you heard about this? As you have gone to church on Sunday. I know I didn't when I was going to church on Sunday. So here it is. We are sinning and breaking a commandment of the Lord. Because we're not being taught. What he wants us to do. Come to church. Have a holy gathering. Fast on this particular day. We ain't being taught that. And it's right here in the word for us to learn, brothers and sisters. Why aren't we learning in our houses of worship that we must keep these feast days, these holy days? The Lord said, be careful of the pastors who are not teaching his word. Let's read what the Lord said about the pastors who are not teaching his word. Jeremiah, the 23rd chapter, verses 1 through 4. Jeremiah 23, verses 1 through 4. And it reads, Woe be unto the pastors that destroy and scatter the sheep of my pasture, saith the Lord. There are people that don't even want to go to church anymore, brothers and sisters, because they feel like it's a show. They feel like it's all for show. And then because they feel it's all for show, they just turn all the way away from God totally. So the Lord said, Woe be unto the pastors that destroy and scatter the sheep of my pasture, saith the Lord. Therefore, 
Thus saith the Lord God of Israel against the pastors that feed my people. You have scattered my flock <clears throat> and driven them away and have not visited them. Behold, I will visit upon you the evil of your doing, saith the Lord. And I will gather the remnant of my flock out of the countries where I have driven them. So how did you get in America? The Lord just told you. How, how did you get in Jamaica? The Lord just told you. How did you get into Haiti? The Lord just told you. I'll read it again. And I will gather, which is why after the Day of Atonement, the Feast of Tabernacles come, in which he gathers us from the four corners of the earth. You'll, read, you, you, you'll hear about it next week. He said, and I will gather the remnant of my flock out of all the countries where I have driven them. And I will bring them again to their foes, and they shall be fruitful and increase. And I will set up shepherds over them, which shall feed them, and they shall fear no more, nor be dismayed. Neither shall they be lacking, saith the Lord. So today we're lacking. What are we lacking from? The knowledge of God according to the Bible. And why are we lacking? Because we don't have men of God who are teaching. What thus saith the Lord. We don't have enough of them. In contrast to the people that need it. Yeah, we got brothers who are out here teaching the word of God. But for the majority of those who are teaching, you're not teaching this word. Because we don't know about the Lord's Feast of Tabernacles. We don't know about the memorial of the blowing of trumpets. We don't know about those things because they're not teaching it. We are lacking Brothers and sisters. Now, we believe in the God of this book. We believe in the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. We believe in the prophets of this book. We believe in the scriptures that's written in this book right here, brothers and sisters. And we have faith that these words are faithful and true. Now, some have watched this Bible show, this truth hour, and wondered, why is it that these brothers pray towards Jerusalem or towards the east when they pray. Our homeland and our holy place was built in Israel, brothers and sisters, in Jerusalem. And King Solomon in the book of 2 Chronicles, so I want you to turn your Bibles to the book of 2 Chronicles, he petitioned the Lord in 2 Chronicles. And he asked the Lord, he said, Lord, if anybody prayed towards this house that I have built for you, then please hear their prayer. So we're going to go to 2 Chronicles, the sixth chapter, and we're going to read, brothers and sisters, why we pray towards Israel. Now, this is not a requirement. You don't have to do this, brothers and sisters. But we just want to explain to you the reason why we do it. Because we want the Lord to hear our prayers. Um, Second Chronicles, the Chronicles, the sixth chapter, verses thirty-four through thirty-eight. Second Chronicles, the sixth chapter, verses thirty-four through thirty-eight, and it reads: If your people go out to war against their enemy by the way that you shall send them, and they pray unto you towards this city, so wherever we're at, if we pray towards God, towards God. From whatever city you in, it says, if you pray unto the, if they pray unto you towards this city, which you have chosen, which was Israel, Jerusalem, and the house which I have built for your name, then hear thou from the heavens their prayer and their supplication and maintain their cause. So, King Solomon is asking the Lord, Lord, please, if your people be in another city and they go to war or wherever they go, if they turn towards this city and the house that I have built, which is in the east in Israel, brothers and sisters, King Solomon said, then hear thou from the heavens their prayer and their supplication and maintain their cause. If they sin against you, for there is no man that sinneth not, according to the word that I just read. 
and thou be angry with them and deliver them over before their enemies, which is what the Lord did to us. He delivered us before our enemies. And they carried them away captives unto a land far off or near. Yet if they bethink themselves in the land, whether they are carried away captive, we've been carried here captive, and turn and pray unto thee in the land of their captivity, saying, we have sinned, we have done amiss, and have dealt wickedly, if they return to thee with all their heart and with all their soul, in the land of their captivity, whether they have carried them captive and pray towards their land, which thou gavest unto their fathers and towards the city, which thou have cho has chosen and towards the house, which I have built for thy name. Then hear thou from the heavens, even from the dwelling place, their prayer and their supplication and maintain their cause and forgive thy people, which have sinned against thee. So this is the petition that King Solomon asked the Lord. And this is why we stand and we face Jerusalem when we pray, brothers and sisters. Because our father, our ancestor, King Solomon, asked the Lord to hear our prayer when we should do so. Now, despite the things that we have done against the Lord and we are doing currently, whether knowingly or unknowingly, brothers and sisters. When the Lord comes, as I said earlier in this broadcast, that he pleads with us to atone for our sins and to turn back to him. Let's go to the book of Jeremiah, the second chapter. The book of Jeremiah, the second chapter, we just have um, three more places after this to go. Jeremiah, the second chapter, the Lord said, hey, if you turn towards me and you have a sincere heart and you ask me to forgive your sin, then I'm going to do so. Jeremiah, the second chapter, and we're going to read verses one through nine, and it reads, moreover, the word of the Lord came to me, saying, go and cry in the ears of Jerusalem, saying, thus saith the Lord, I remember you. The kindness of your youth, the love of your espousals when you went after me in the wilderness in a land that was not sown. Israel was holiness unto the Lord and the first fruits of his increase. All that devour him shall offend. Evil shall come upon them, saith the Lord. So if anybody messed with us, the Lord said he was going to bring evil down on them. Verse four, hear ye the word which the Lord, O house of Jacob, and all the families of the house of Israel. Thus saith the Lord, what iniquity have your fathers found in me? That they are gone far from me and have walked after vanity and become vain. Neither said they, where is the Lord that brought us up out of the land of Egypt, that led us through the wilderness, through a land of deserts and of pits? through a land of drought and of the shadow of death, though a land that no man passed through and where no man lives. And I brought you into a plentiful country to eat the fruit thereof and the goodness thereof. But when you entered, you defiled my land and made my heritage an abomination. The priest said not, where is the Lord? And they that handled the law knew me not. The pastors also transgressed against me and the prophets prophesied by Baal and walked after the things that do not profit. Wherefore, I will yet plead with you despite all this that you have done to me. The Lord said, I will yet plead with you, saith the Lord, and with your children's children will I plead. So the Lord is going to give you an opportunity to atone for your sins after that last trumpet is blown, the memorial of the blowing of trumpets, which signals his coming. When he comes, the Lord is going to plead with you and give you a chance to do what we're going to be doing 
nine days from now, atone for our sins, brothers and sisters. Isn't that a good God, a good Lord that would do something like that? We've sinned against him our whole lives, yet he still is willing to forgive us, brothers and sisters. That's a beautiful thing. Because if it was up to man, man wouldn't forgive you for some of the things that you have done. They still hold it against you. I remember when you, when you was out there selling drugs. I remember when you was out there doing this. I remember when you was out there doing whatever it is. Man is quick to bring it up and throw it in your face. The Lord said, hey, once I forgive you, I'm not bringing back up what you've done to me. Because love holds no record of wrongs. I'm going to say that again. Love holds no record of wrong. So you don't keep bringing back up over and over and over again what a person has done to you once you have forgiven him. If you do that, we know that you really have not forgiven them. You can say anything out of your mouth, but it's your actions, brothers and sisters, that you're going to be judged by. Let's go to Ezekiel, the 20th chapter. We're going to read verses 33, Ezekiel, the 20th chapter, verses 33 through 38, Ezekiel 20, verses 33 through 38, and it says, as I live, saith the Lord God, surely with a mighty hand and with a stretched out arm and with fury pured out, I will rule over you and I will bring you out from the people and will gather you out of the countries wherein you are scattered with the mighty hand and with the stretched out arm and with fury pure poured out. And I will bring you into the wilderness of the people. And there will I plead with you face to face, like as I pleaded with your fathers in the wilderness of the land of Egypt, so will I plead with you, saith the Lord. Now, because this is written in the Old Testament, some people believe that this was already done. No, brothers and sisters, Ezekiel, Jeremiah, Nehemiah, Isaiah, all these prophets are prophesying what is yet to come. It has not taken place yet, brothers and sisters. That's why when people tell you we don't need the Old Testament no more, you throw on the way prophecy that is yet to come by not understanding that these prophets in the Old Testament are prophesying things that have yet taken place yet. But when a pastor has no clue or no idea or does not understand the word of God, brothers and sisters, you will get those things. Let's go finally, brothers and sisters, Remember, after that last enemy is defeated, which is death, the eighth day, which means that the father is coming to take his place on this earth. And that's why the Lord's Prayer, Jesus said, our father, which art in heaven, hallowed be your name, your kingdom come. If the father's kingdom is coming, then where do you think he going to be? If his kingdom is coming. Let's go to Revelation 21, verses 2 and 3. This is our last place. Revelation 21, verses 2 and 3. Let's find out what the Lord is going to be. And the reason why we're going to hear, brothers and sisters, is because when Jesus comes back, which is the reason why we celebrate this high Sabbath day, the memorial of the blowing of trumpets, which remember, he can't come back into the last trump. So when he comes back at the last trump, memorial of the blowing of trumpets, he comes and pleads with us and gives us an opportunity to atone. Now you got the Lord's day of atonement, right? And then the next day is, 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 is the Feast of Tabernacles, the great end gathering in which he gathers us from the four corners of the earth. So he has to do all of these things in order to prepare us 
for the eighth day, brothers and sisters, the day when the Father himself shall come down to this earth and make his abode with us and live with us. This is the time when there will be no more flesh and blood. Because remember, flesh and blood cannot enter into the kingdom of God. So when the, Jesus said in the Lord's Prayer, Our Father which art in heaven, hallowed be your name, your kingdom come. Who's going to occupy the kingdom when the kingdom comes? You can't go in there as a flesh and blood human being. You have to have a spiritual body. That's why when the Father comes, there will be no more flesh and blood. Flesh and blood cannot enter into the kingdom of God. Let's read about what happens. Revelation 21, verses 2 and 3. And it reads, And I, John, saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down from God out of heaven. Thy kingdom come. Prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. Who went up there and prepared it? Did not Jesus say that I go to prepare a place for you? Number three, Revelation 21 and 23. And I heard a great voice out of heaven saying, behold, the tabernacle of God is with men. Where do men live, brothers and sisters? Here on this earth. So if the tabernacle or the holy city or New Jerusalem is coming down from God out of heaven, then what's up there with God is coming down here to be with us. Well, we've been taught that we're going up there to be with God. That ain't biblical. That ain't the Bible we've been lied to. Behold, at verse 3, the tabernacle of God is with men. And he, talking about the Father, will live with them. The Father is coming to live with us. And we've been told all this time that we are going up to heaven to live with the Father. That ain't what the book is saying. So what are you going to believe? The old way of thinking that was passed down to us? Or are you going to believe the word of God? Your belief have to be based on something. This is so good that I got to read it again. And I hate interrupting over and over again, but I got to explain to you, brothers and sisters, what the scripture means so you can get a different look than what you've had at it before. Let's read it again. Revelations 21 and 3. And I heard a great voice out of heaven saying, behold, the tabernacle of God is with men and he will live with them and they shall be his people and God himself shall be with them. Well, if we was going to heaven, wouldn't it have said, and they are going to be with God? No, this is saying, and God himself shall be with them, talking about us, and be their God. So brothers and sisters, all these feast days, all these holy days is preparing us, number one, for the coming of the Son of God, even Jesus, Yahshua. Then Jesus comes and prepares us for the coming of the Father. So happy High Sabbath day today, brothers and sisters, the memorial of the blowing of trumpets, a day in which God commands us to have church, a holy convocation and coming together. To do what? To read and to understand his word. So tonight we have had a holy convocation. If you are able to, and I hope that you are. Attend Bible class with us tomorrow afternoon at 12 o'clock so we can be in compliance with the word of the Lord. And then nine days from today at sundown starts the Day of Atonement, the only day of the year that the Lord commands that we fast. No food. No water from sundown into sundown. Last place. I want to close back where we started in the book of Leviticus because I want to read it again. Leviticus, the 23rd chapter. And if you want to know all of the Lord's feast days, they are written in Leviticus, the 23rd chapter. There are a total of seven feast days of the Lord that we are commanded to keep.
And this is why we don't celebrate Christmas or Easter or New Year's or any of the days that man calls religious holidays. And they were originally began and created for the worship of idol gods. Just go type it in. All you got to do is type in the God of Easter, the pagan origins of Christmas. Who is the God of New Year? Who is the month of January named after? The God Janus. That's why they changed the months of the year. And we'll show you how just now by reading this. Leviticus 23 and 23. It says, and the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, speak unto the children of Israel, saying, in the seventh month and the first day of the month, which is today, you shall have a Sabbath, a memorial of the blowing of trumpets, a holy convocation. The seventh month, September. Huh. Let's, let's look at it, right? <laughs> As I said before earlier, if October, because any word that begins with O-C-T means eight, octagon, eight sides, octopus, eight tentacles. So October, the etymology or the root of the word October means eight. Nove means nine. Any word that begins with D-E-C means 10, decimal point, rounding to the nearest tenth, decathlon, 10 races, a decade, 10 years. Any word that begins with D is 12. So what would be the first month of the year? It would be March, brothers and sisters. Now, that's why springtime is always somewhere in the month of March. So let's count it out. You got March, April, May, June, July, August, September, seventh month, October, November, December, January and February. So again, we are in the seventh month and the first day of the month according to God's time. And so what are we supposed to be doing right now, brothers and sisters? Let's read it again. And the Lord, Leviticus 23 and 23 through 25. And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Speak unto the children of Israel, saying, In the seventh month, in the first day of the month, shall you have a Sabbath, a memorial of the blowing of trumpets, a holy convocation. You shall do no servile work therein, but you shall offer an offering made by fire unto the Lord. And what are we doing nine days from now? Which is what this lesson was about today. We're preparing ourselves to keep the day of atonement, which comes with the fast. Let's read it. Verse 26. And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Also in the tenth day of the seventh month, so the same day of the month, it's the first day, so nine days from now, also on the tenth day of the seventh month, there shall be a day of atonement. It shall be a holy convocation. Got to have church on that day too. And you shall afflict your souls, which means that you must fast. An offering, an offer, an offering made by fire unto the Lord. So, brothers and sisters, this is the time. These are the holy days, the feast days, or what we call the Sabbath or high Sabbath days that the Lord commands us to keep. Thank you so much for your time. Happy Memorial of the Blowing of Trumpets. Those who are on YouTube, Please go on Facebook and like our Facebook group page, which is called The Truth Hour Bible Show. Those who are on Facebook, please go to YouTube and like our YouTube channel, which is called Truth Hour TV. And it's about to come up in the comment section right now. Truth Hour TV. If you would like to be added to our text message, invite reminder list then text your name and the keywords truth hour to 312-719-7310 312-719-7310 and what we will do brothers and sisters 
is we will text you a reminder before we go live on the air and you will get the reminder along with what the lesson will be for that particular Tuesday. All right. So again, I love each and every one of you. We're going to stand and face Jerusalem um, and pray before we do that. I want to say for those who are suffering out there from an illness, from a hardship, from a broken heart, from a failed marriage, from financial difficulty, or whatever it may be, brothers and sisters, we want to petition the Lord a special prayer for you. 